lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. In today's show, I'm going to do something I truly love to do, talk DIY with two DIY divas, Annette Gutierrez and Mary Gray, authors of the new book, Potted, Make Your Own Stylish Garden Containers. Decorating can be incredibly expensive, but Annette and Mary are masters at repurposing, and they often troll hardware stores for inspiration. Their new step-by-step book, Potted, shows you how to create 23 show-stopping containers made from everyday materials such as concrete, plastic, metal, terracotta, rope, driftwood, and fabric. The projects that Annette and Mary shared in their book are affordable, they're made from accessible materials, and most importantly, they're gorgeous. They include clever takes on everyday objects found at the big box hardware stores around the country, like the Cinderblock Garden that made its way into the hearts of apartment therapy and their readers. They riffed on the amazing designs of Pawina Studio, using a common chimney flue and turning it into a stunning graphic planter. Their book is jam-packed with color photographs and simple instructions. You'll find it's super Super easy to follow. Potted is for anyone who wants to turn an outdoor space into a stylish oasis. Timber Press's new book, Potted, Make Your Own Stylish Garden Container by Annette Gutierrez and Mary Gray. That's the topic of today's show, and it's coming up after an update on the listener community for the show and this week's Garden News Roundup. But first, I'd like to welcome any new listeners listening to the podcast for the first time this week. If you've just found the show, I want to say welcome and thank you for being here. And I hope that you listen to many gardening podcasts during your week. I was just a guest with Jackie Beyer on the Organic Gardener podcast, and that was a blast. I read an article this week. There's a new podcast gardening podcast called Botanical Brew Haha, so give that one a try. And this week, the Joe Gardner podcast has a great episode out, and it's called How to Preserve Fruits and Vegetables from Your Organic Garden with Teresa Lowe. That's a fantastic listen. Anyway, I'm a huge fan of podcasts in general. I think they're such a great way to grow and learn And I know you have lots of choices, so that's why I'm sincerely honored you're spending some time here listening to the Still Growing Podcast. Now, I want to make sure that I remind you about my three-month mastermind opportunities that will be starting up in September. One is for bloggers, podcasters, writers, or content creators, and the other is for industry professionals, landscape designers, greenhouse growers, and nursery owner operators looking to grow their business. And if you'd like to learn more about those opportunities, just head over to my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And then just click on the tab that says work with me and you can find out more about these opportunities. In my own experience, masterminds are very energizing. So whether you mastermind with me or not, I just want to encourage you to be open to a mastermind opportunity because they will change your business and help you stay focused, hold you accountable, and the advisement can't be beat. So if you're interested in being part of a professionally facilitated mastermind with me at the helm, I would love to mastermind with you and I hope to meet you in one of my groups. 
I'd also like to invite you to join the listener community for the show. It's a free private Facebook group I host for listeners of the show. These folks are made up of gardeners of all skill levels and locations. They're from all around the world. And you can find it on Facebook by typing in the name of our group into the search bar. Just search for the Still Growing Podcast Group and the listener community will show up at the top in the search results on Facebook. You'll have access to all of the great garden articles that I curate during the week. They'll all automatically appear in your Facebook newsfeed. The Facebook group is the only place I go to pick lucky listeners for any show giveaways. And Mary and Annette are offering a giveaway with today's show. So stay tuned because details about that will be coming up at the end of the show. You also get the opportunity to interact with the great guests that have been on the show. In fact, Annette and Mary both joined the Still Growing Podcast Group, and they'd love to chat DIY with you. And I just love that feature of our group, that listeners of the show and guests of the show get to continue the conversation beyond the podcast after the show is done. And that's exactly what I envisioned when I put the group together. Finally, the content I share with the listener community on Facebook is something I work very hard to make sure is helpful and worthwhile for you. Everything I post is curated with you in mind to help you and your garden grow. Plus, it's free and easy to join. Well, with that, I'd like to welcome new members to the group These are folks that have joined the Still Growing Podcast group, and they are Darcy Daniels, Sarah Trandall Rosenquist, Richard Carroll, Jay Park, Carol Wallen, Mark Johansson, Monique Kleindienst, Kirsten Emke, Elsie Aldejando, Cynthia Varamo, Sarah Bennett Tunks, Edgeworth Carter, Lois Williams, Elaine Inderland, Christy Kirtley, Blake Ra. Melanie Sizemore, Elaine Griffin, Stephanie Norton, and Sloane Tredegar. Welcome, you guys. Every week in the listener community, listeners share beautiful pictures and videos of their gardens. This past week, Catherine Trainer shared a gorgeous picture of a butterfly on her sunflower over at Little Falls Farm, Laura Gonzalez shared her first harvest. It's her first poblano pepper harvest, and she'll be cooking with peppers in the kitchen all week. So, Laura, don't forget, don't touch your eyes. Make sure you wash your hands after working with those peppers. Listener Michael Lockstanford shared a great picture of his sweet potato vine pyramid, and here's what he wrote. I don't remember who shared but I saw someone's picture here and made my own sweet potato vine pyramid from an old upside down tomato cage. Thanks for this group. Listener Alan Staley shared an adorable family picture and they're standing in front of these huge, looks like 10 to 12 feet tall sunflowers. They're just fantastically happy in his garden. And he wrote, I finally got a good family photo after our first year in our community garden plot. And I'd say it's been a very successful endeavor for Alan. Laura Johnson shared a beautiful picture of her Connecticut garden. That was stunning. Kathleen Brown Bonafonte shared an amazing side-by-side photo of a before and after of her trellis. And she said, amazing to see what can grow from April to July. Isn't that the truth? Edgeworth Carter shared a picture of his English cucumbers that he had sliced into a salad. My mom would go crazy for this salad. It's the one with the cucumbers and the onions. She loves that one. And then Danny Perkins shared a video of a dragonfly in his garden, and he said, I have fewer butterflies this year, but lots of these guys. And then he also shared a video, a slow motion video, and I love when he does this. And this time, his slow motion video was featuring the hummingbird moth. That was mesmerizing. Listener Charlotte Hutt shared bees and other pollinators loving up her artichokes that have been allowed to bloom. She wrote, bees and other pollinators love the artichokes we leave them. LaVon Hamelman chimed in and said, artichoke blooms are so radiant. 
And I tell you what, if you want to see a pollinator party, let your artichokes go to flower. The pollinators will thank you. Patricia Chandler Newport shared pictures of her garden harvest. Pretty impressive. Beth Engel wrote after she saw this picture that her dinner tonight was those white cucumbers that Patricia had harvested. Beth apparently is growing them as well. She said they're very tasty. They do have a lot of seeds, though. Sue Luftig said she was jealous of the beets. And Patricia admitted that she didn't really like beets and she kind of forced herself into loving them. And now she loves them. She says the yellow beets are her favorite. And then this was fun. Sue Luftig wrote, I have terrible luck with them growing beets. I never have beets that get big enough. And Patricia wrote back, she said, I've had the same problem in the past. I've always planted my beets near my beans. And then I read they don't get on with beans and they tend not to fatten up. So she moved them away from the beans and lo and behold, they grow just fine now. And guess what Sue replied? Sue said, oh, my goodness, I have always planted my beets next to my beans, and you can bet your bottom dollar that Sue will be moving her beets to a new location away from the beans next year, and I hope you have better luck next year too, Sue. So thanks for that tip, Patricia. Listener Philip Busili shared gorgeous pictures of his garden this week in the listener community. He just has the prettiest little garden right outside of his gorgeous brick house, complete with window boxes, and I just love window boxes. And Philip wrote that he's a big fan of English gardens, and he gets a lot of inspiration from the BBC show Gardener's World, and you can totally see it in his beautiful English garden. Just loved those pictures. Patricia Chandler Newport shared a jaw-dropping picture, and she wrote this, check out my next-door neighbor's trombocini squash growing over the top of my clematis and rose of Sharon up the telephone pole. And she shows this telephone pole that's on her property, and the squash is growing up that diagonal wire that extends from about 20 feet up on the telephone pole and then goes down to the ground. Well, the squash discovered that wire and started to grow up the wire. And now it's climbing the top of the telephone pole. So she wrote, it's easily 20 feet high now. No idea how he's going to pick squash from up there. (laughs) Love that. Anyway, I wrote Patricia and I said, you need a sign. Beware of falling squash. And then listener Carrie Maselli chimed in and said, I can just imagine the headlines if it causes an outage. (laughs) I loved this picture. That was a good one, Patricia. And then on a semi-funny note, Patricia shared a picture of this very nibbled on produce that she has coming out of her garden because anybody who's been active in the listener community for a while knows that this summer, Patricia's garden, her personal garden, has been plagued by this crazy woodchuck who's eating everything in sight. And fellow listener advisory board member Beth Engel said, Can I giggle without making you mad? Woodchucks need vegetables too. Well, anyway, I think Patricia's taken some matters into her own hand as far as dealing with her woodchuck issue. But I thought even just the way she was holding this very chewed on produce kind of said it all. Patricia was at her wits end here. We've all been there. In listener plant IDs, Esther DeWaters shared a picture of a flower growing in her garden, and she said, can you ID this for me? My daughter gave it to me last year for Mother's Day, and the rabbits ate it down so thoroughly that I thought it wouldn't come back. Fortunately, it did, but I don't remember what the nursery tag called it. And one look at it, and I knew it was Gallardia, but I didn't know the variety. And Horace Kephart correctly identified it as Gallardia Arizona Sun. Now, Gallardia's common name is Blanket Flower, and I've never had that much luck having it come back in my garden. So Esther, if the rabbits chewed it down and it still came back, 
it must love your garden. So enjoy that happy looking galardia. Just lots of blooms on that baby. In listener love, I want to give a special shout out to Marissa Marie, a new member who joined. She wrote, I'm currently listening and catching up. Thanks for the ad. I'm a small acreage farmer working on sustainability through plants and animals. My farm is Whippoorwill Farms, and I've been at this about one and a half years so far and learning lots as I go. I'd also like to give a huge shout out to listener Ashley Holloway. Ashley jumped on a video chat with me this past week and gave me some great tips and advice for getting my Instagram page going. I just have not done that and I've been meaning to do it. And you know how it is when you need to start a new social media platform. It can be a little overwhelming. But Ashley gave me some super great tips. And if you have any advice for me to make my Instagram successful or other folks that you think I can learn from, please let me know. You can find me over at Instagram at sixfootmama.com, just the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A. I'm trying to do some Instagram lives every day just to get used to the platform. And if you join the listener community on Facebook, go ahead, introduce yourself and share your Instagram handle with me. And I'd love to follow you back. Anyway, I got great feedback from Melissa Vickers. She's a listener in the Facebook community. And then fellow garden blogger Tanya Peel says that the gardening community on Instagram is amazing. And I'm starting to discover that for myself as well, Tanya. So I agree with you. I also want to give a shout out to all of the listeners that contributed photos for me to use in my album cover for the Echinacea episode that I put together last week. I was hoping to put together a collage of a variety of different Echinacea, and thanks to the response from the listeners and the listener community who shared their Echinacea photos with me, I was able to do that. So thanks, everybody. That was super fun. And I love seeing the variety of echinacea that you're growing in your own gardens. That's tremendous. In the listener community, there were also some questions about pests and problems people are experiencing in their gardens right now. Edgeworth Carter wrote in and said, Is anyone seeing dahlias bleach like this? My salvia are also affected. Philip Busili properly diagnosed that it was powdery mildew. And Patricia Chandler Newport said to mix potassium bicarbonate with water, a little dish soap, and mineral or horticultural oil, and then you spray the leaves weekly. That should cure the trouble, Edgeworth. And then Spencer Hoadley wrote in. He said he was looking for help with his hens and chicks. They were given to him by his mother-in-law, and hers are doing amazing, but his seem to be struggling. He said they're in an organic, bark-type soil, and he was wondering if they could need a thicker, more clay soil. He also said, I've cut back on watering as I think I might be overwatering them. And then he showed a picture of his side-by-side with his mother-in-law's. So his mother-in-law's are thriving, and they're blooming And then his are just little starts in a pot, and they're not looking super thrilled. So here's what we all replied. I personally love to grow hens and chicks. So I wrote, excellent drainage is needed and full sun. And I tend to plant more of mine in the ground, not in containers as much. I like to plant them in the ground next to big stones or boulders to kind of help create a little microclimate for them. Because when those boulders and rocks absorb that heat from the sun, it creates that little microclimate and I find that they do better there. My other trick is I tend to plant them a little high. I mound them up a little bit as I plant them. I don't bury them in the ground because they need drainage. And if I do have them in a pot, I make sure to bury the pot before winter comes. And then I dig it up in the spring. And the wonderful thing about that is that when you dig it up in the spring, you see all the little baby chicks that were born underneath all of that mulch while the plant was overwintering underground. That's always a thrill to see. 
Listener Sen Bar had a great suggestion. She said, if you're using a container, use cactus soil and don't overwater. And then Patricia Chandler Newport reminded, hens and chicks are succulents. They don't need much water. Drier, sandy soil is what they need. So good luck on your hens and chicks and Twin Falls, Idaho, Spencer. I just love the listener community for the show. It's so fun for me to be able to interact with you and see posts from folks who share our passion for gardening and have a curiosity to learn more. So come hang out with us. Don't be shy. I'd love for you to join for free. The next time you're in Facebook, just type Still Growing Podcast Group into the search bar and then request to join. I look forward to meeting you in the group. Now, before I forget, I wanted to make sure to remind you that you can listen to the show on your Echo Dot. So if you have an Echo Dot or an Echo, something from Amazon, you can ask it to play the podcast. And I'll demonstrate it on mine right now. Here we go. Alexa, play the Still Growing podcast. Getting the latest episode of Still Growing, a weekly gardening podcast. Here it is from TuneIn. Alexa, stop. Isn't that handy? I love that. And then speaking of reminders, if you'd like to get in touch with the show, You can always call the phone number for the Still Growing Podcast. It's 865-333-GROW or 865-333-4769. I'd love to hear your voice. You can share suggestions or comments about the show or questions you might have about your own garden. All right, now it's time for the Garden News Roundup. This is a curated group of posts and articles that I've shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group, and it's made up of a dozen different segments, from updates on past guests to articles featuring fascinating folks in the world of horticulture that I'd love to chat with. And that's something I call the Dream Guest Segment. I also cover news and information on specific topic areas like sustainability and science. And then the other segments are really designed to honor the commitment of the show to helping you and your garden grow. And they are the how-to DIY segment, the continuing ed segment, the plant spotlight, shopping, recipes, inspiration, and quotables. Now, what's nice about this for you is that you can stay somewhat abreast of the news in horticulture and gardening just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated articles and posts for yourself because I share it all with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group. So if you hear something and want to read the full article, There's no need to take notes or track down links. Just head on over to the group and join. All right, let's kick things off with the guest update. Guest Jennifer McGinnis over at the blog Frau Zenny shared her August calendar and her August garden chores. That's always a wonderful source for information and inspiration for things to do in the garden. I love reading that. And then past guest Lori Neverman of the blog Common Sense Homesteading shared an amazing post. This was truly amazing. She shared a before and after of her homestead. And it's quite stunning what they've been able to achieve in the years that they've been on this property. So the pictures compare and contrast different aspects of this property over the past 13 years. The original pictures are from 2004. And they're contrasted with the pictures from 2017. And sometimes those are so fun to look at, those types of retrospective pictures on our gardens and our properties, because year over year, we can feel like we're not making much progress. But the years add up, and it's always fun to look back and realize just how much you've gotten done. That was fun to see. In sustainability, there was a great post in the Dallas Morning News, and the headline was, Weed Control Does Not Have to Be Toxic. 
They bring up things like corn gluten meal as a natural weed and feed fertilizer, organic contact killers that you can use, including vinegar, essential oils, hydrogen peroxide, cinnamon, and fatty acids, using all of those things in the garden. And then it said that there are several fatty acid and plant oil products on the market, including BioSafe, Burnout, EcoSmart, Monterey Herbicidal, just to name a few. And when I read about that BioSafe, it made me think of a post that listener Igor Skoken recently shared in our group. Igor wrote this, Cleaning the aisles in our garden from weeds the scientific way. In our garden association, cleaning aisles between plots is an all-summer exercise. This year, I tried the weed control product from the BioSafe company, and it's simply called BioSafe Weed Control. He learned about it listening to the podcast of Paul Parent. It's an organic herbicide, safe for humans and pets, does not go into the soil. It kills all the green objects. And then he shared pictures of his results. That was fun to see. It was great to look at Igor's pictures and see the results of using BioSafe on his paths. Listener John Silverio brought up a post I'd shared a while back, and it was this great idea to store your seeds in empty Tic Tac boxes. So if you have leftover seeds from your garden, Tic Tac boxes are a great way to store them. So I added that back into the sustainability segment this week as well. In the continuing ed segment, Herbal Academy shared a great post called Who Else Wants to Learn About Spanish Moss? And then their article correctly starts out, for starters, Spanish moss is neither Spanish in origin, nor is it a moss. Spanish moss is actually an air plant that grows hanging from tree branches, gathering its nutrients and water from the air. This was a great post if you want to learn more about Spanish moss. In the how-to DIY segment, Organic Gardener out of Australia shared a good article, a very good article, about sprouting your own seeds and then using the sprouts as superfoods. And here's what they wrote. Sprouts are the powerhouse of superfoods. They're also easy to grow. Organic sprouting seed is available from seed suppliers or health food shops. Try sprouting alfalfa, broccoli, chickpea, fenugreek, kale, lentil, mustards, and sunflower. You can grow sprouts in a large glass jar, colander, hemp sprout bags, sprouting jar or dome sprouters. And then it goes on to talk about the jar method. This was a very good article for the How to DIY segment this week. And then also in the How to DIY segment, succulent master Deborah Lee Baldwin shared a great video on how to create a mounded succulent arrangement. And why I especially loved this one is that she's incorporating the use of shells. And this video is actually a potting demo that she did at Rogers Gardens. This is an excellent DIY video to watch. There were a number of plants in the plant spotlight this week. First up is Allium Ambassador. This was a post that was shared by Phoenix Perennials, and they wrote, Coming this fall, Allium Ambassador has fantastic six-inch spheres on tall stems. These Allium bloom between Globemaster, which blooms in May, and Gigantium, which blooms in June and July. So Allium Ambassador allows you to keep that bloom going all season long. Then the blog Veg Plotting shared some great ideas for pollinator plants. They include perennial cornflower, globe thistle, perennial wallflower, Phlox paniculata, preferably the white over the pink flowers, and Verbena bonariensis. That's a great list. In the news this week, outlawgarden.blogspot.com shared a great post about container addiction. So if you love containers, you're not alone. Lots of listeners wrote in and said they have this very issue. Beth Engel said her garage is filled with pots not in use, and I've got to make room for those that have to come back in. 
And then I wrote her back and said, me too. And they're just too awesome to let go of. I have many repurposed around the house as well. Small pots hold eyeglasses, cheaters for me, pens and pencils, earbuds for the kids, wall chargers for all their devices, cables, chapstick. And then I told her, the kids won't know how else to organize or corral things without containers. So that was a fun look at container addiction. And the news here locally was a great story about why Japanese beetles have been particularly bad in the Midwest this year. Entomologists at the University of Minnesota confirm that the destructive pests are thriving right now, especially in Minnesota. And the cold, wet springs that we have usually kill them. Unfortunately, this year, we had a very warm spring. As long as it's above 50 degrees, they can be active and feed on roots. In the Dream Guest segment this week is bartender Brendan Ambrose of the restaurant Firefly. This was an article that was featured in Washington Gardener magazine, written by Anna Hurler. And bartender Brendan Ambrose said, forget farm to table, I'm growing your drinks rooftop to glass. So Brendan started working at Firefly about a year and a half ago, and his signature drinks combine his rooftop harvest with 24 years of bartending experience. And the result is something that is both classic and fresh. Brendan makes cocktails such as the Transformation Cubed. It's a gimlet with house-made basil lime cordial poured over an aviation sphere. And then he's got a fun drink called the Aw Snap. It's got Plymouth Gin, Sugar Snap Pea and Tarragon, Rosemary Lemon Thyme, among other ingredients. So if you're interested in checking out Firefly, it's adjacent to the Kempton Hotel Madeira in the DuPont Circle neighborhood. And Brendan kind of took on this whole rooftop garden challenge all by himself. He said, I just started as a bartender and in passing one day, I heard someone say, you know, it's a shame what happened to the rooftop boxes. So in hearing this, I ran up to the rooftop and it was literally just four six by six foot boxes that were just overweeded and a mess. I don't even think they were growing anything. So I would come in every day about a half an hour or an hour early and do as much as I could to get those garden rooftop boxes up and running. And now a year and a half later, we're really starting to see the fruits of our labor. Herbs are the garden's main focus, but Brendan hopes that the executive chefs will be able to incorporate more produce in future dishes as the garden continues to grow. This was a very inspiring story, and that's why bartender Brendan Ambrose is in the Dream Guest segment this week. In Science This Week was an article that was called The Other Milkweed Caterpillar, Milkweed Tussock Moth. And I wrote this to the listener community when I shared it. Heads up, Monarch Nation. If you planted milkweed, you're probably also seeing tussock, not just monarch caterpillars on your plant. And you could be seeing quite a few of these little guys. And they look like they're ready for Halloween because they're mostly black and orange, very furry looking with a little bit of white. And then listener Beth Engel reminded, don't touch them. I can't believe they didn't mention this in the article because people can have reactions to their hairs. From Wikipedia, many tussock moth caterpillars have urticating hairs, often hiding among longer, softer hairs, which can cause painful reactions if they come into contact with skin. So another reason to be very careful about the caterpillars that you're picking up in the garden. And a good reminder to check your milkweed, because if your milkweed's getting devoured, you just might have a tussock moth caterpillar infestation. So make sure to check your milkweed. 
Also in science, Mother Nature Network shared a great article that was called How to Identify Different Types of Bees. And what was fantastic about this article is that they included these amazing photographs of bees close up so that you could distinguish between all the types of bees, everything from honeybees and bumblebees to carpenter bees, mason bees, blueberry bees, squash bees, and so on. Listeners really appreciated the detail in this article. And then finally in science this week, there was a great post in the Daily Mail. I thought this was very fascinating. And the title of it's called Roses Are Red, Violets Are Blue, and Now Thanks to Science, Chrysanthemums Are Too. Scientists created the world's first blue chrysanthemum. This post was shared at the end of July, and it's taken scientists 13 years of research to create the blue chrysanthemum. They used DNA from a butterfly pea and Canterbury bell and transferred it to a plant bug. And then the microscopic bug carried the blue genes into a chrysanthemum. Now that's crazy. And then when the seeds were taken from the plant a year after the process began, the chrysanthemums grew and they emerged with blue petals. And then I bet all the scientists did a dance and then went out for drinks. The chrysanthemums gorgeous and it's been verified as true blue by the Royal Horticultural Society. In Recipes This Week is an avocado toast recipe that was featured on Food 52. And in a moment of kismet, past guest Deborah Madison, the author of Vegetable Literacy, recently shared on her social media that avocado toast is much fancier today. But she did publish a recipe for it back in 1990 in The Savory Way. She had two avocado toasts. And then she wrote, as always, lots of herbs, pickled onions, olive oil. They've been one of my staple go-to foods for decades. Now, the people who grow up eating avocado toast generally keep it pretty simple. You've got avocado, toast, and then one or two accoutrements. Some people include thinly sliced raw onions and lots of lemon, Others report growing up with avocado, tomato, and alfalfa sprout sandwiches as classics. I know my neighbor grew up having half an avocado sliced and then smashed on top of a bagel or a piece of toast. That was breakfast for her growing up. And if you enjoy avocado toast, I'd love to hear your sentimental way of making avocado toast. Now I'm getting hungry. In shopping this week, there was an article that I stumbled on called Nurturing a Rare and Gourmet Strawberry Plant. And this article was all about the Marshall strawberry. This article caught my attention because right in the beginning, it talked about the Chicago Botanic Garden and lead horticulturist for the Regenstein Fruit and Vegetable Garden, Lisa Hilgenberg. And Lisa was featured on the show back in episode 549. But the subtitle for this particular blog post was How Did the Chicago Botanic Garden End Up Sharing One of the Most Sought-After Strawberry Plants in the World with a Three-Star Michelin Restaurant? And it all begins with information about the Marshall Strawberry. The Marshall Strawberry has a very interesting history. In the early 1900s, it was a widely grown strawberry. In fact, James Beard, the legendary chef and television personality, once said he thought the Marshall was the best eating strawberry in the United States. Unfortunately, by the 1950s, the Marshall strawberry had been largely replaced by other cultivars. It turns out that the Marshall strawberry has a very short shelf life and due to disease, it became a very expensive strawberry to grow. In fact, by 2007, the USDA National Clonal Germplasm Repository in Corvallis, Oregon was one of the few places to even have the Marshall strawberry. 
And today, there are just a handful of private growers that are trying to bring it back into prominence. This is where an artist from Maine comes into the story. Her name is Leah Gauthier, and she's one of the only certified distributors for the once critically endangered berry. So if you go to her website, MarshallStrawberry.com, Leah sells the plants as they become available. In fact, nine are available for this year, and once they're sold out, the next batch won't be available till 2019. Now, there's a fun success story with the Marshall Strawberry that involves the Chicago Botanic Garden. In 2012, Hilgenberg, Lisa Hilgenberg, who was on our show last year, she was given three Marshall Strawberry plants from Leah. In fact, Leah happened to be living in Indiana at the time, and she drove the plants personally to the Chicago Botanic Garden to deliver these Marshall Strawberries. Lisa got the plants in the ground right away. In fact, one was promptly stolen after that. Can you believe that? But just a year later, Lisa was able to propagate 50 of the strawberry plants. And that's how the Chicago Botanic Garden, the Regenstein Fruit and Vegetable Garden, becomes part of the story of preservation and conservation for this unique strawberry. Then this article goes on to describe how Lisa ends up having a chance meeting with a chef from the French Laundry in the summer of 2016, who then gets one of the plants from Lisa, and now he's incorporating the Marshall strawberry into some of his dishes at French Laundry. And then another chef from Great Dixter happened to stop by, and he also got one of the Marshall strawberry plants. Every year when I read about a story like this, I sometimes get inspired to just try to track down one of those plants for myself, for my own garden. And that's just what I did. I went over to Leah's website, marshallstrawberry.com, and I bought one of her nine remaining plants for a whopping $45. So now we'll see if I can keep it alive. But that was my big splurge for this year. And if you're interested in giving that Marshall strawberry a try, you'd like to try to grow it and help be part of the preservation and conservation of this very unique strawberry, then head on over to Leah's website, marshallstrawberry.com. Now I'm waiting. I'm very excited to see my little strawberry come in the mail. So I'll let you know all about it and how it goes over the next year. All right. In inspiration this week, there was a great post. It was shared on housebeautiful.com and it shows 30 acres of sunflowers that were in peak bloom right outside of Washington, D.C. in Poolsville, Maryland. Those pictures were absolutely beautiful. And then Gardenista shared a wonderful post called 10 Garden Ideas to Steal from Chinese Feng Shui Masters. I was very inspired by this article. It included lots of easily implemented ideas in addition to some pretty lofty goals for the garden. And the images were amazing. And this article was written by Michelle Slatala. Finally, in quotables, I have a fun story to tell you about. Yesterday, I was online. I'm in a number of groups that feature new blog posts that are written by garden writers. And one popped up on my feed that was featured in a blog post on the site gardenwithdiana.com. And the title of the post immediately caught my attention. It was called Plant Support Group Needed a Poem. And as you know, if you've been listening to the show for a while, I love to incorporate poems and quotes, little pieces of writing and musings in this quotables segment. And so as I'm reading this blog post, I'm scrolling through and I'm seeing all of the great pictures. And then I get to the end of the blog post. And here is this poem that starts out with, I need a support group for plant addicts like me. And I start reading this poem and I'm just dying laughing. It is tremendous. And so first I reached out to Diana Stahl. She's the author of this particular blog. And I said, do you mind if I share this with my group? And can I read your poem on my show? 
And Diana quickly wrote back and she's like, absolutely, that sounds great. I would be so honored if you share my work. And then I thought, wait a minute, why should I read this? I should see if Diana would read it. And so I wrote her back and I said, would you be willing to read your poem aloud to us? And she's like, absolutely. So next thing you know, we made arrangements to connect. And that's just what happened. So let me cue up my conversation with Diana and give you a chance to hear this wonderful poem she wrote about needing a support group for her plant shopping habit. Hello? Hi, is this Diana? Yes, it is. Hey, Diana, it's Jennifer Ebling. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing so good. I have to say, I really, really, really liked your post. And (laughs) I had to reach out and I thought, you know, I can either read it or I can actually call you and see if you'd be willing to read it. Because I always think it's so great if I can make that connection and have the author of the poem read the poem. Well, sure. Well, I'm just delighted that you liked it. Wonderful. So now you're out of Chicago, is that right? Yeah, we live about 30 miles, 35 miles northwest. We're like in a suburb and we're actually out a little further, not really in a town. We're kind of in the country, although the suburbs are surrounding us. Oh, okay, <laughs> we okay. Used, we used to be a lot more country. <laughs> and it's just grown up around you. It sure is. Hey, did you go to the Garden Bloggers Fling? I did. You did, and I missed you. Were you there? I was there, but, oh. you know, it's such a big group, it's hard to get to see everybody. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, and I'm a little newer at it, and so I don't know a lot of people, so um, I was meeting a lot of people. So even some of the people I met... I don't even know. I mean, it's going to take a couple more times before I really have a good taste with the name kind of thing. Although I found it to be, it was my first one of this past one, and I found it to be a really friendly, welcoming group. So, you know, I just had a great time. Yeah, no question. It was super fun. It always is. It's wonderful. It's super fun. Are you planning to go to Austin? You know, I don't know if I'll be able to go to Austin because I'm the manager of a garden center. Okay. And, you know, May is kind of it. And yep. so being early in May might, I don't know. I don't even know if I'm brave enough to ask to go. Yeah. <laughs> Let yeah. alone that they would say yes. <laughs> yes, it is. I, di- I didn't even think about that timing wise. That You're right. That'll be tough. And a lot of folks do work at garden centers. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we'll so we'll see. I'm just, you know, I'm like, it's a long ways away. So we'll see. Yeah, that's right. Have you ever been on a podcast before? I have. Yay. What podcast have you been on? I was on Mike, you know, Mike, the vegetable gardener guy. Sure. Yeah. I did his um, last year one time. That was fun. Oh, that's great. What'd you talk about? We uh, we talked about, I had done like seed, made my own seed tape and stuff. So we talked about that. Oh. And then we, we ended up going into butterflies and monarchs and, and all kinds of other things we weren't planning on, but that was okay. <laughs> that's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, now what's the name of your blog? Tell me really quick. Garden with Diana. Garden with Diana. How long have you been blogging? About a year and a half. Oh, so you're a newbie. I am. I have wanted to do it for years and years and years. And just about a year and a half ago, I was like, that's it. (laughs) I'm going to find the time. I'm going to do it. And, you know, it's been the most wonderful thing. That's great. What do you like to blog about? Oh, I blog about anything garden related. You know, I Mm -hmm. love when we went on, you know, saw all those gardens and I love to share those with people. I love to talk about plants, events, things at work, people that I meet in horticulture. I mean, just anything Anything. is fair game. Wow. Yeah. Well, the thing I loved about your post that caught my attention is that it said plant support group needed. (laughs) (laughs) And it just (laughs) caught my attention. And I thought, well, this is so perfect for this time of year because August hits. And I think there are a lot of gardeners that look around and see flats and containers of plants that have still not yet gotten planted in the garden because we've just gone crazy (laughs) all summer long. So I really identify. You mean I'm not the only only one? (laughs) You are not. You are definitely not the only one. And so I have this segment that I do every week and because I love garden poetry myself. And I usually read 
read the listeners some garden poetry. And I thought when I started reading your poem, I just was like, this is exactly just this is exactly like what I would share with the group. And so it just struck me. And I have to say, the image of the back of your van (laughs) 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 with all of the plant material in the back. I'm just like, at this point, why do we even bother trying to protect the trunks with any type of plastic sheeting? It's, you know, we are just fooling ourselves. Oh, my goodness. I need to get my car detailed so badly here. But I laughed because I'm like, oh, this woman and I could do so much damage. We went shopping together. Oh, my, oh goodness. my goodness. And then I loved where you're like, have you ever been to a perennial sale? The plants don't just call. They scream and plead and jump off the benches. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so you, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. So. <laughs> <laughs> no oh, doubt about awesome. it. Well, I tell you what, why don't I have you read this and then let's do a quick debrief at the very end, okay? Okay. So here's Diana Stahl with Plant Support Group. I need a support group for plant addicts like me, a group who understands why plants make me giddy. I need a support group where everyone agrees the smell of new mulch is all the perfume we need. I need a support group that will never judge when my driveway is so full of plants, the car just can't budge. I need a support group that needs time off work to vacation in the garden. Who cares about housework? I need a support group that gardens at night and to see what they're doing, wear hats with headlights. I need a support group that would rather get dirty than dress up for dinner or go to a party. I need a support group with folks I can share the joys of the garden and the plants that live there. Bravo. I loved it. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) And hats off to you because you kept it completely together. I turned down my volume as you were reading it because I knew I was going to start chuckling at parts. (laughs) I thought, I want to completely not interrupt you in any way. You did a wonderful job. Oh, Oh my goodness. So I love that. Now, do you write poetry on a regular basis? um, You know, just when the mood strikes (laughs) every so often. There's just a few poems on the blog just when, and it just sometimes I'll, you know, I'll start writing like I started writing this one and I'll be like, I need a support group. Oh, that (laughs) sort of sounds good. I need a support group. Oh, (laughs) it kind of just happened. (laughs) That's wonderful. Well, the line that got me was where you were saying you need a support group that gardens at night to see what they're doing. (laughs) They wear hats with headlights, and I'm laughing because uh, just last I week have, we were talking I about have, this very thing. The, <laughs> it was so funny. The motivation for that was last fall I was out in the garden, and, you know, I mean, I work full time, and, and because I'm the manager, I am there like 50, at least 50 hours every week. Oh, I and I don't have, I don't, you know, it's hard. And so in the fall, as the days are getting shorter and you get home and there's like, it's starting to get dark, you, you have things you still want to do. So I would have, I had a flashlight and I would take it and I would set it on the ground <laughs> by where I was working. <laughs> and I was telling my friend at work and her husband bought me one of those um, helmets with the <laughs> headlight on the top. <laughs> and so I, so I have that now. Which is so funny, and I'm like, I don't know how many other people do this, but there must be someone out there that does this besides me. Oh, oh absolutely. I had a, oh, I had a listener uh, talk about finding earwigs in her garden, and then another listener chimed in and said, oh my goodness, we totally, I wear this hat that's got that bead of headlights on, on the brim, yeah. and she, and she yeah. goes out and picks <laughs> off the earwigs, and then her kids come with her, and I'm like, oh my gosh, your kids are never going to forget this, like putting on those minor hats and going out with mom in the garden. You know, what a memory. Just fantastic. But that was the line. I mean, I I was reading it to myself and that's the line where I'm just like laughing out loud and the kids were in the house and they're like, what mom, what? I'm like, oh, this poem is too good. Just tremendous. 
Oh, my goodness, Diana. Well, thank you so much for coming on the oh. show and reading your poem. I can't thank you enough. And I'm going to share it in the listener group and I'll share it in the show notes for this episode. And it will come out August 11th. Oh, well, that is great. Well, and it just was so much fun talking with you. And I'm sorry we didn't meet up at the fling because it sounds like we would have gotten in a little trouble together. Oh. That would have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We've been, we were separated at birth, Diana, for sure. So <laughs> <laughs> I think God knew what he was doing when he kept us apart, probably. But I tell you what, next year, if you go or the following year, I'm sure we'll have a chance to connect then. And if you do come to Minnesota to visit, relatives, let me know. I'll swing on down and head to the South Metro and we can at least meet for coffee. Maybe that would be fun. Yeah. Well, Diana, thank you so very much. You have a great rest of your evening. Lovely, lovely poem. I'm sure people are going to (laughs) just get a tickle out of it. I just, I thought it was wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. All right. Have a great evening. Uh, You too. Talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye. Well, that was a treat. What a wonderful way to wrap up the Garden News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder, you can get all of these posts with links and bonus content in your Facebook feed if you join the listener community, the free Facebook group. It's called the Still Growing Podcast Group. And the next time you're in Facebook, just search for that and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. With that, let's transition to the topic of today's show, Timber Press's new book, Potted. Make your own stylish garden containers by Annette Gutierrez and Mary Gray. Today, I'm over the moon tickled to share my conversation with Annette and Mary. These gals are proof that you can reinvent yourself at any point in your life. Annette and Mary actually met many years ago in their former careers in the film industry. With no retail experience, they bought a rundown pottery store, which they built into a gardening destination and brand. Today, they co-own and operate their brick-and-mortar store, Potted, in Los Angeles. Potted is an outdoor lifestyle destination and brand. Annette runs the marketing and design work for Potted. She writes the Potted blog and contributes to Sunset Magazine's blog and many print publications. Mary was a set decorator and art director for television and commercials. Mary is now the head of all things visual at Potted, creating compelling installations and curating the diverse objects used as planters. Potted has been featured in the LA Times, Sunset Magazine, the Los Angeles Magazine Best of, California Home and Design, Country Living, Gardenista, Apartment Therapy, Design Sponge, Garden Design, and the Huffington Post. As the creative forces behind the brand, Annette and Mary are always on the lookout for everyday objects and unique uses for products geared toward outdoor living to excite and inspire their customers. It's one of the reasons they're a successful business and why many people choose their store over the big chain stores. Now, what sets them apart are their original potted designs, garden pavers, tile tables, and especially pots. They are called potted after all. Annette and Mary share a passion for design, and that compelled them to write their book, which is filled with inspirational and original ideas to help you make your own planters from everyday materials. Beyond being affordable, they wanted to create projects that were gorgeous and accessible. You do not need a workshop or countless tools at your disposal to build these planters. In fact, when they were coming up with possible ideas for their book, they asked themselves three simple questions. First, is it affordable? Second, are the materials easy to find? And finally, can you do it on your own? If the answer to any of those questions was no, they threw out the idea. Finally, the most important consideration to both Annette and Mary was that the finished product had to look absolutely fabulous. 
You're going to love listening to Annette and Mary and hearing about their potted style firsthand. Well, hi there, Annette and Mary. Hi, Jennifer. This is Mary speaking. Um, We're really thrilled to be with you today. We can't wait to go through all of the projects on the book and all the things that you were excited about hearing from us. (laughs) Absolutely. This is Annette, and I'm just as excited. That's wonderful. Well, I'm thrilled to be speaking with you about your book, Potted, which is also the name of the store you both own in Atwater Village in Los Angeles. Folks who know about your store rave about your distinctive eye for outdoor home decor and accessories, and that's largely because both of you bring some unique strengths and backgrounds to the gardening space. Annette, your background is as a screenwriter, and Mary, you were a set decorator. How did you come to be owners and operators of a garden store, and how has your background in TV and film helped you drive your success with Potted? Well, this is Annette. That is a question we get asked a lot. Mary and I have been really good friends for many, many years, and both of us were in the film business. And, and, you know, it's a difficult business. It's a business that you sort of age out of or just at some point get disillusioned with. And both of us were looking for something different that we could, you know, sort of call our own. Like as a screenwriter, my job was always to come up with something. And as soon as I came up with this great idea and spent a year working on it, then a director would take it away and, you know, it was like, bye-bye, thank you. And that's a really frustrating experience. So, but And Mary had a similar experience where she would create these amazing spaces and then have nothing to do with the outcome. So we really wanted to own something. We wanted it to call it our own. And it was kind of an accident, but I was actually going to the vet and next door to the vet was this very old pottery store. And I walked in and I went, wow, this is amazing. And at that time, Mary and I were making, at the beginning of our DIY uh, bus, we were making these garden pavers with tiles. And, you know, we thought we were going to take over the world with them. And I just walked in and I said, hey, would you want to sell these pavers? And the guy goes, not really, but I'm selling the store. (laughs) Oh. And I called Mary and I'm like, they're selling this store. And yeah, and so six months later, well, three months later, we were the owners of a store. <laughs> oh, honestly. And um, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out a name. We knew what we wanted to do, but it's grown and evolved over the years beyond our wild expectations. And the and Potted was born. Now, how did you come up with the name Potted? I have to ask. This is Annette. Well, I actually really think that was Dave, Dave. wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mary's ex-husband, Dave, who um, he's just a clever guy. And, and first he kept saying pothead. And, you know, we're like, no, no. And then the garden tarts, which has sort of has it has stuck with, as a moniker for us. So a lot of times you'll see things are from the garden tarts. But, we, you know, we didn't really feel that tardy at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so potted was just funny, but yet it said exactly what it was and it, it was cute and it was simple and quick and uh but it was funny early on we had a lot of pot stores trying to link to our site going we're, we're a perfect combo we're like yeah we're not really that kind of pot. <laughs> oh, gosh now how do you describe your store it, do you call it a garden store or how do you refer to your store when people ask me that, and I think Annette does the same thing, we t- this is Mary, we typically say we're an outdoor lifestyle because we do more than just outdoor. We do indoor plants, we do rugs, we do throws, we do jewelry. It's funny because this is Annette. People call us a lot of times, they say, do you have a acer palm with a blah, blah, blah? And I said, you know, we're not really a nursery, although we do specialty plants. I said, we're a pretty store. So basically, we're about making the outdoors pretty. So, you know, and you can go to a nursery and you can find just rows and rows and rows of stuff. But the difference with us is that we, when you come into Potted, we're trying to inspire you with environments, with places that you go, oh, I want that. And really, when we started the store, that didn't exist. I think Smith & Hawkins was the only place that actually did that. And, you know, coming from a film background, when you pitch a movie, you pitch it as when Harry Met Sally meant Final Tap, which is a very odd combination. <laughs> but, 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 um, and so how we pitched it was anthropology meets Smith and Hawkins, because okay. even Smith and Hawkins was much more utilitarian. And we really wanted to amp it up a notch and say, you know, hey, this, this, you can make it just as pretty. And now it's a much more common thing. 
Yes, we, we call it sort of exterior decorating in some way. Exterior ways. decorating. Well, I'm chuckling as you're describing it because you are not trying to be a nursery, and yet there are many garden centers and nurseries that have to try to be more like you nowadays in order to sell more and have greater success in the marketplace because people need to see how to incorporate these plants successfully into their exteriors, and that's what you guys do so well. You just focus on that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely what we try to do. I mean, if, if, when you, I hope, get to come see our store one day, it is so small. When you have a small space, you need to be very, very creative. And I think a lot of people in the country, have, you know, if the world is like going more urban. People are moving into smaller spaces. But it doesn't mean they want less outdoors. And so how do you, you know, what is it? The necessity is the mother of invention. Yes. And it's so true. Like we have things hanging from the ceilings. But, but it all, you know, you just look around and go, oh, my gosh, there's so much stuff here that I am inspired by. And we don't want to lose sight of the plants. I mean, the plants are definitely a big part of the business, but there's so many nurseries and there's very few stores like us. And you're completely right, is all these garden centers really need to amp up that part of it. And it's not that difficult. And I think they slowly are, actually. Yeah, they are. Now, I'm really curious, and I know this is going a little bit away from our topic, which is your fabulous book, but I would be just completely remiss if I didn't ask this question on behalf of of all of the owner operators that listen to Still Growing, do you have any tips for them? If they're running a garden store, a traditional garden store, and they're trying to create these gorgeous living spaces, these gorgeous exteriors that you guys do so well, do you have a few staging tips for them or setup tips for them, some things that they should look to do if they're trying to do that successfully in their business? Yeah, hey, this is Mary. I, I'd say rather than just looking at one big picture, they should create areas, section things off and create a space for do they want to do something sort of cottage and then highlight the plants and the pots that speak to cottage, modern, traditional, but create areas that when they walk in, if they're, if they're more modern type people, they'll look at that and they'll go, oh, I could do that. And it gives them automatically something to hook into as opposed to just a wide row of pots and a wide row of plants. So be careful. As we learned a lesson one time, we sell this fantastic brand of furniture called Furmom. And it's not an inexpensive line, especially this Luxembourg chair. And so we thought we were going to be so clever one time. And you have to buy, we have to buy the chairs in pairs. And so we had bought all these different colors, and we had this amazing cheap table. And we said, look, let's, let's put a different color chair around the table because people will get this great idea about all the different colors. So this woman walked in, fell in love with it, bought the set exactly as it was on the floor, and then we were left with eight different chairs that had no partners. Oh. And, it was, <laughs> and it was, and we had such a hard time selling those chairs because who wants one chair? Right. So be careful sometimes that you don't get too close. <laughs> think, oh. You have to sometimes think about practicality a little bit too. But who would have who would have thought? Who would have thought? I love that story. That's awesome. Your store features so many garden containers, but it's your unique designs for potted exclusives. Your custom planters, your tiled tables, and your garden decor that have really helped you make a name for the potted brand. Now, one of them has been a true standout, and it's the circle pot. When I read about this, I started, I put a little heart around it, and I said, this is their firstborn. It's their baby. And it's featured on page eight of your book. I was really glad to see it there. I, I started. And I'm wondering how you came up with that design. How were you inspired to create the infamous potted circle pot? This is Mary. It, um, it's kind of a funny story. I have a sister who lives in Oklahoma, and she, of course, is a garage sale thrift store junkie, much like myself. And she sent me an old ashtray from the 60s in the mail and said, hey, I thought you might like this. And it was similar to our circle pot, but it was an ashtray. It was a hanging ashtray that there was a lot of hanging everything in the 60s. <laughs> and so Annette and I were looking at it, and we're like, why couldn't we refine this, change it, work a few things so you could actually plant in it and make it a hanging pot? Because at that time, we didn't see very many interesting hanging planters. 
So that's kind of how that baby came out. And it continues to be a great seller. I see it up places, you know, hanging in yards, and I'm it's really it gives me a warm feeling. <laughs> that's great. Well, and I noticed in the book that it's orange. You picked an orange one for the book. Does it come in other colors? It, it does. This is a net. It comes in chartreuse, white, and we have eggplant, but I think eggplant hasn't been quite as popular. So I think we're going to come up with another blue. We used to have it in an aqua, but I think we're going to come up with a, a new blue. That's always the fun thing is coming up with a new color and being able to bring it out, but you never know how much people are going to want it. Well, I tell you what, I just got done with the Garden Bloggers Fling and Pam Pennick was at this last Garden Bloggers Fling in D.C. And we went to a garden. It was the garden of Linda Hostetler and people were going crazy for her cobalt blue, her use of that cobalt blue. So if you're looking for color inspiration, check out Pam's post. I know she wrote a post about it. Linda Hostetler and also Helen Battersby of the blog Toronto Gardens also wrote a post about this blue because people went crazy for it. Uh, okay, well, I will definitely check it out. I know both of them. So. Well, there you go. Oh, there's your there's your new color lead. Well, I used to work in human resources for big national retailers for about a dozen years before I quit to stay home and raise the kids. And one thing that I was trained to look for when we went into a store setting was something called the shadow of the leader. And I noticed when it came time to dedicate your book, Potted, there was no question that you were going to dedicate the book to your staff. And you wrote, to our one wonderful potted staff who gave us the peace of mind and the support we needed to work on this book wholeheartedly, but especially to Sydney Michael, who held together our photography with her positive energy and endless hours of collaboration. I always think that it, the best shadow of good leaders is their great staff. So I'm very curious what your secret recipe is for building and retaining a great group of people to help you and your customers at Potted. Huh, that is the million dollar question. <laughs> that. You, you know, and, and that is, it, it, we have a lot of friends who are small business owners now over the years. And I think the biggest thing that comes up between everybody is, the, the hardest thing is employees. And and what's wonderful is that we have some employees we've had now for 10 plus years. I would really say it's allowing people to have some say in what goes on and not be uh, authoritarian, not like this is the only way, this is our way or it's the only way. Because then people tend to feel like it's just, it's how I used to feel as a screenwriter sometimes when it was like, thank you for your input, bye-bye. Nobody wants to feel like that. It's just not a very nice way to, to be treated. And we really, really try to work with and grow with our employees. And for the ones that have stuck with us, I think we've allowed them to grow and they've, they've made us who we are as well. I mean, we really could not have done it without them, especially the book. Also, I think with, with our staff is we're a very friendly store. It's almost like coming into a cocktail party without the alcohol. <laughs> you know, people sit and chat. You know, there's lots of discussions going on about plants or a dog comes in or a baby comes in. Some of the people that come into our store, their children are four, five, six, seven years old, and we, they were coming in when they were pregnant. So uh -huh. there's, a light, there's a lot of a community, and our staff, they're part of that community. So it makes a big difference. Yeah, I mean, this is a net again. I want to go to work because I want to go there and enjoy it and not be like, oh, I have to go to work. And yeah. part of that is about who you're going with. If there's drama and all this kind of other weird things going on, it's just not a pleasant experience. So we really, really try to create an environment where everybody is happy and, and enjoying themselves. I love that. You know, the potted book, I tell everyone that this potted book is a DIY lover's dream because you guys share your tips for how to make 23 original DIY outdoor planters. And you divide your book into five main sections, and it's all around the main materials you like to use. So there's concrete, there's plastics, metals, terracotta, and then organic materials. And you have a section in your introduction on page 10 that simply says, do-it-yourself basics, how to think creatively about everyday materials. And some people come by this naturally, 
And for others, this can be a stretch. So I'm curious how you encourage people to build that skill. This is Mary. Jennifer, it it is kind of a skill that some people come by more naturally than others. But I, I think you can cultivate it. And a lot of the way cultivating it is just opening up your mind. You look at something and it's just a square. Well, it could be a plant holder. It could be a tissue holder. It could, you know, you could cut it down and, you know, make it an olive holder. You just have to start thinking some things won't work and some things will work. But you you have to sort of allow yourself to run through a gamut of yeses and nos as opposed to being, I think what most people do, they're scared it's going to be wrong. So I think you have to just not be scared it's going to be wrong. And that sort of frees your mind up a lot. Because before you say yes to something, you say no a lot. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. So I'd say for people who aren't, you know, don't come by it naturally or haven't cultivated over years, that the best thing to do is don't be afraid to have some duds, (laughs) you know, go ahead and, and make those mistakes. Absolutely. That is a very, very important point. Well, and I'm imagining, too, that as you guys are creating your projects, the first try might not be the one, but it stimulates that creativity even more or probably more problem solving. And then your next attempt is more successful. Yeah, the marbleizing planter one. It was funny. It was the very first first project I created because I thought this is going to be so easy. (laughs) Oh my goodness. But let's just say now that I could absolutely marbleize a guitar on uh, YouTube. (laughs) You're the marbleizing (laughs) master. Yeah, exactly. That that was one of the most frustrating projects I have ever done. And we finally got it down. So hopefully whoever reads our instructions will not have the experience that I did, but it was, it was so funny. I was tearing my hair out. I must've done 25 different attempts at it and finally figured it out. But wow, that was a head scratcher. Wow. Well, on page 14, you chat about something that I'm so passionate about. And it's something that gardeners can sometimes underestimate the importance of, and that's good drainage. Let's chat about that. And then also, I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about the use of cash pots. This isn't that again. So that's an absolutely amazing question because we get asked this all the time. If customers are always coming in, I want a centerpiece for my interior table. Um, I can't have any drainage. And, you know, I, we've tried to over the years get people to get this theory in their head. If you were going to buy fresh flowers for your interior table, you, they would last a week. If you want to create a planting in a pot without drainage, it's going to last maybe two months. So if the end game there is that's way, way better result, but it is not going to last. No plant does not like drainage, except for maybe log plants. You know, we did that in the stock tank one where we did actual water plants, but every single plant wants good drainage. And so if you stop thinking about those as permanent arrangements, you're going to have a fine time. But the cash pot, cash pot is basically the French verb, so cash air to put and then pot. And, and basically what that is, is it's a pot that has no drainage and you put your nursery pot into it. And that's a really, really wonderful solution to have drainage. So the nursery pot has excellent drainage and it's just sitting in there. A lot of times what I do, because the nursery pot isn't necessarily going to be the right height, I'll put gravel on the bottom of it to give it the right height and then it can drain into the rock, but it still has airflow around it. It's not the same as planting over rock. Everyone seems to think that's a great method. It may make you feel better, but it doesn't work. So do you sell a lot of cash pots at Potted? Oh, absolutely. We sell a lot of cash pots because houseplants have got a huge resurgence. I mean, it was funny. For years and years, people were afraid of houseplants. And now I think that 70% of our business now is houseplants. So we're doing a lot of interior planters. And cash pots are the best for that because you can swap things out. But, But mainly it's because saucers aren't always so pretty. And, you know, we're about pretty. So it's much better to use it as a cash pot. Then you cash pot becomes the saucer. And then you just use moss or something like that on the top so you don't see the nursery pot. And it works great. The plants do really well that way. Mm, That's a great idea. 
Let's use the way your book is organized by material, concretes, plastics, metals, terracotta, and organic materials, and then we'll feature some of the cool ideas that you had for your containers. So if we start out in concrete, I wanted to begin by chatting about this contemporary planter, this very simple, streamlined container, and you used backer board. It's just such a hip looking container. But before we talk about it, what is backer board? I'm not familiar with it. The beauty of backer board, this is Mary, is that you can get it at any hardware source. Backer board is, is a sheet, usually four by eight or four by 10, and it comes in half inch and three quarter depth. And it is used for tiling, like in your bathroom, your walls, your your floors, they don't use wood, plywood. They use backer board. It's cement, essentially, is what it is. It's okay. sheet cement. So that's how it works so well. So it's like you're creating your own cement container. <laughs> you have to cut it and secure it. But, if, you know, a lot of people don't. We live in Los Angeles. You can get pretty much anything you want here. But a lot of places across the country, you can't. This is the way to people who want that look, which is modern, to get that. Okay. And then you secured that backer board with these L brackets, basically. Yes, I used L brackets, but after it was done, I started thinking you could use those continuous hinges. So you had hinges all the way down it. You could make your own hinges. You could use old fashioned door hinges. There's a lot of different things. As long as you're securing those corners, you know, it's a trip to the hardware store. And once again, looking around going, oh, that would hold. It's just really something that would hold it together. Okay. So you could do a lot of different things. You could do leather. You could do, you oh, know, leather. there's a lot of things you could do. Oh, Ooh, that leather. Would be fun. I like yeah. that idea. Yeah. Ooh, let's make that one. <laughs> yeah, let's do, let's do that one. We can repurpose belts. We can have all kinds of yeah. cool things with buckles and whatnot. But I love the hinge idea. I was wondering, too, when you were using the L brackets, do you screw all the way through the backer board or do you just go right into it and it doesn't come out the other side? No, I comes out a little bit because that backer board's three quarter inch thick. Okay. Um, so it'll come out just a tiny bit. Okay. But you know, it's on the inside. It shouldn't be a, an issue really. But okay. yes, it, it it pokes through a little bit. Okay. I was wondering because when I was going to create mine, I was thinking about, well, maybe I use the L brackets on the inside so that people can't see them. But then I wondered if the screws were going to poke through and then if maybe I needed to adhere some type of like nail head trim or something would look cool too to cover up the screws if they protruded a little bit. Well, you know, I mean, that this is, and, and hence all how all, this is not how all these projects came to be is like we started making them going well what if well how could we do this or whatever exactly. like I love your idea of putting it on the inside you could also probably I mean we've become I think best friends with all building adhesives now so uh, and they are amazingly strong so you probably could just use building adhesive if it cured properly it would it could hold it all from the inside and then if you also did adhesive on the edges to give it a little bit more strength um, it would probably work. Uh, you know, again, it would be the kind of thing like I, the only the only problem is, is that when the soil gets wet inside, it might torque it out a little bit. But, you know, you'd make it and go, oh, that didn't work. It, yeah. <laughs> but I, th- I think it could work. I like your idea. You're right. You could use, you could use a, a upholstery finishing thing, the, yes. the cap, and yep. that could look really cool. I mean, we actually thought about that. Like that might be an interesting way of finishing it on the outside. But m- the modern people really like it super, super clean. And that was more what we were going for. Sure. I I told you in the pre-interview chat that I felt like we were just sisters separated by the miles because I think there's people who are total DIYers and we're just wired to think this way and we speak the same language. I was just laughing to myself when you brought up building adhesives because you have this little two-page section right at the beginning on page 12 and 13 and you talk about all of the tools and the tips of the trade that you guys have put together. And as I was going through the list... The one that I starred, put brackets around, put hearts around was where you were talking about building adhesives. Can I put you on the spot and have you dish a little bit on some of your absolute favorites? You know, I think liquid nails 
is has I've always had a soft spot in my heart for liquid nails. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just it's right there in the name. You know what I mean? Yeah. They they all. I I honestly couldn't say like a brand that was so much better than another brand. And but I really we've really had good luck with liquid nails. Loctite is a good brand. But the, the main thing that you need to look for when you're using building adhesive, especially if you're using it for what we are, which is um, items that are going to get wet, is they have to be waterproof. And that is the V there. Yeah. Some of those adhesives are silicone adhesives so that they, you know, they bind and they also help with the water. So in those cracks where you're putting things together, it helps for you don't want the seepage to get in there because it'll basically eventually pull it apart. Ah, okay. All right. I'm making notes. Well, Apartment Therapy featured your cinder block candle wall. I thought this project was a total standout. It's absolutely radiant in the evenings with the candles in the paint. And you mentioned early in your book that the idea for this planter came from seeing a pile of cinder blocks in a building yard and wondering, what if? I love origin stories, so tell me everything. Tell us about that day, and then tell us about this fantastic project. Well, what if, I think, is the basis of every single thing we do. <laughs> what if, I mean, I, I, I think what if is, is a question for everything. Like when I remodeled my house, and we'd look, my husband and I, what if we moved the entire kitchen over there? <laughs> so, you know, be careful with what if. But I think how this book came to be was we walked around hardware stores and building yards and looked at things and went, hmm, what if? So the original one that was done on apartment therapy several years ago Actually, gosh, now I think it's almost like eight or nine years ago. We had a client, a customer, a good, good customer, who's, a, who's an interior designer, who's very sophisticated, has seen it all. And that's a very difficult client to have because she came to me and she said, I want something that no one else has. Hmm. I'm like, well, gee, thanks for that. But of course, I love a challenge. So I was really like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And I'm walking around and there was just a whole pile of cinder blocks. And the way people had been taking them off the cinder blocks they were graduated down so that they looked like they were cascading. And I went, wow, what if that was a planner? You know, and it just came to me because really it was how they were removed from the original pallet. Because normally they come in a square, right? The way a pallet is loaded. And that was how that idea came from. So as Mary was saying earlier about opening your eyes up, how do you look at things in a different way? That is something, I don't know whether it's some, a skill that, I was born with because my dad was a contractor or what, but I always look at things that way. And so does she, because she's had to do that for years, doing film sets and things like that. How can I make this work? What could I do with this? What if it was something different? So that was how that one came to be. And it was hugely successful in apartment therapy. I mean, we were sort of shocked, actually. The title for this project is The Cinder Block Candle Wall. So I know sometimes it can be hard for people listening to imagine what we're talking about here, but walk them through it. Describe this project and the steps involved, and especially don't leave out your genius idea of how you screened the bottoms to keep the soil in. I loved it. Okay, then that again. So the original idea, the, the one that was in apartment therapy, didn't have the candles. So when we were coming up for the ideas for this book, we thought, how could we elevate this project? And so the idea was take some of the cinder blocks and instead of laying them flat as planters, do them upright and paint the inside, and then you could get glowing candles going through them, which really ends up being so cool looking. But the question every single person asks, and we've, we've changed it a few times, is how do you keep the dirt from falling out of the bottom of the cinder blocks? And the very first one we did, the one for apartment therapy, we actually cut out backer board and wedged it in there and liquid nailed it. And it was such a complicated process. And then I realized this was very silly. You could do it two ways, actually. You could do it the way we do it in the book is we take sheetrock tape and sheetrock tape is slightly sticky. So when they go into the corner, they cut the sheetrock tape to create sort of the form so that when they mud over it, they make it smooth. It gives them something to put the mud on. And it's sticky, so we just cut it across the bottom and then added my very favorite liquid nails on top of that to give it some extra strength. And it worked 
fabulously. But you can also use really heavy duty netting for you know screen doors, the plastic version. Don't use metal; metal will uh, deteriorate very quickly. Oh. But you use the nylon version, and it works incredibly well. Well, there you go. And so I'm imagining that would be a great material to use at the bottom of any pot that might have a large, too large of a drainage hole. Just use screening material, plastic screening material. We actually use plastic screen material for a lot of people, you you know, and the holes at the bottom of your pots, they'll do broken terracotta. For mm. us at the store, it's not that practical. We actually use small screen uh, at the bottom of our pot. What a great idea. Well, and I thought the other thing that really made this pop, and you showed a nighttime photo of it, is the fact that those little openings, when you put the cinder block on its side and you have those peekaboo, those little see-through areas, you painted the interior of those and that gives the candle something to bounce off of, to bounce that light off of. Yeah, I mean, we love color. And so this was so much fun experimenting with different colors and things like that. Well, because it's all, what's also nice about it too is that in the daytime when it's not lit, you get that color and it's just, you know, I mean, you can keep the whole thing very neutral. It actually looks lovely without being painted, but the painting just, I don't know, it just took it to another level and, and it, you know, got our coloring yayas. I love <laughs> we it. love painting stuff. Now, when you painted that, did you use any uh, particular kind of paint? You know, we're just using an exterior home paint. Um, oh. It's latex based. It works great because the concrete is very porous. So you sometimes have to apply it maybe you know more than one coat, but it, it's quite easy, actually. It accepts it very well. It works really well with a little roller. With just the little roller, yeah, because then you can get in there. Yeah. Love it. In the section on plastics, you love PVC, but also there were some unique items in that section that I thought you featured that people might be unfamiliar with. So, for instance, you actually have a project that you made out of vent wall pouches, which I didn't even know they existed. And then there's a great story that accompanies this discovery and how you repurpose these on page 79. So I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind reading that introduction for us, and then let's chat about it on the other side. Okay, um, this is Mary. So, and yes, you know, we didn't know they could be used for anything else, and we didn't really know what they were either. <laughs> <laughs> On our continuing quest to build amazing vertical gardens and tight spaces, we literally stumbled upon these roof pipe vent covers at our local building supply after someone left a pile on the floor. Lying at our feet like an offering from the DIY gods, they needed only a couple of minor modifications to become a wonderful wall planter. These practical pockets can add lush life wherever you are short on space, we found the perfect place for these versatile little pouches at an industrial modern meets cottage home where the patio was calling out for a bit of green to soften the sparse environment. So it was quite by accident that we found those. And, and it speaks again to keeping your mind open to what you're looking at when you're looking at it. Well, let's talk a little bit about this vent wall pouch. For people who are listening to the show right now and they have no idea what we're talking about, describe them to us and then how you used them in this project. Okay, uh, this is Mary. It's a hard plastic around the outside and then the part where the pipe fits in is a kind of a rubber, but it's all molded as one piece. It's on a roof. They use it and they put the pipe inside of it to go into the house or the building, and they use it in conjunction with flashing. Yes, and what I thought was great about it is once you see it through the lens of using it as a container, people have to imagine that the flat part that goes around the pouch is almost like creating a perfect frame, like it's framing the the wall hanging for this plant. And then the part that's the rubber part that you're talking about becomes this pouch that you're going to plant inside. And it's genius for that. Yeah, it kind of came together pretty perfectly because that square around it it, it does. It frames it out perfectly, you, which makes it very graphic when you use a bunch of them at one time. And also the other thing that made it quite clever was the way, because it sits on a roof, the, the part that the pipe fits into that becomes your planter 
it's angled. Mm. So the w- bottom part of that, the bigger part of that angle is what becomes your planter. And then you cut off the other part where, and, and that's the top. And it's, it's pretty clever that it, it worked out so well, <laughs> really. I really, really liked this one. Now, how did you use the flashing panel? What role does that serve for this project? In the back, I use just flat flashing to back it up with just to give it a, a place for the dirt. It becomes the back, really, what happens. Okay, okay. And you just used your favorite adhesive with that again, probably. <laughs> yes, I think I used a flexible seal. I think I used a silicone seal because of the water. Oh, you know, sure. there's going to be water in that. So I used that. I tended when there was a lot of water being used. I knew because it's a small space. And that water will sit with that rubber. So I wanted to use silicone. Well, I love that one. And then I also loved this next one. It was actually one of my favorite projects in the plastic section. And it's simply called the Totally Tubular PVC Planter. I thought this one was brilliant. You wrote, alone, the four-inch pipe didn't seem significant. But when we imagined it as a bouquet, we saw so many possibilities. I love that. This one is such a fantastic DIY for folks. I thought it was super easy. And you have this brilliant part that you found that attached to the end that I thought people will just be blown away by how perfectly that that fits these planters. Mary, do you want to tell us about these? That was a really happy accident too, which, you know, once you start looking at things, it all sort of comes as a piece because they are used in construction. So there's all sorts of working parts, whether they're elbows or cappers. And on the bottom of that is a, it, it's basically a capper or a drain. And that's what was used on the bottom of it to finish it off. So It's all part of that same modular system where everything works together. Yeah, they're really like Legos for guys, right? If you're doing construction work, once you start working with PVC, you'll see there's all these fantastic little pieces and parts that are designed to fit right on there. And you got lucky. You struck gold when you found this snap-in drain disc that went on the bottom. You didn't have to come up with any way to create your own bottom to these planters because the drain disc fit perfectly. It was just snap it on, right? Are you trying to say that we're lazy? No, <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I just thought it was genius. Yeah, I, no, it was, it was the net. That was definitely a happy... I mean, that's the most part. Usually you find a solution for things that, that a lot of times they're just right there in front of you. And you're like, wow, this is yeah. so easy now. I turned the page. I saw that drain, drain disc <laughs> you, were, you were demonstrating. And I'm like... Oh my gosh. I, I think I like called out and my kids were sitting in, in the family room going, what? And I'm like, you won't believe this. This is so fantastic. And then I wrote here because I always love to mark up all the books that I get. And I just put disgustingly simple exclamation mark. That was a great find. You know what I, You know what else is kind of cute about that? When we, it was an earlier project that we were working on and you see that there is the stenciling. Thank you. We did the stenciling. When you buy PVC, it's shiny. And when we first started working with it, went to uh, sand it so that the stenciling would adhere better. And then all of a sudden, it sort of took on this matte charcoal quality. And we're like, this is so beautiful. And that's how that surface came about, totally by accident. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. I know. I know. So what I'm seeing in the book, that beautiful color, all you have to do is sand it and you get that? Yep, with a fine, you know, don't use a heavy chunk of sand. It's just, I think we put what we sanded it with, but yeah, a, a, a lighter sand. And it gives it that, it looks like charcoal. Oh my gosh, I love that. Well, the metals section is coming up next. And I thought this one was a great source of inspiration for folks. And I have two words for you because this was my favorite project. And it's the gables. It was such a great project and it had such a lovely outcome and I thought it was another wonderful example of repurposing gone wild. You had to be so pleased with the results of this project. Do you want to walk us through this Annette? Tell us about this project and then the overall impact of the result. Yeah, absolutely. We were we were very pleased. As it was just funny because it was Mary and I walking through, I think we were in Lowe's this day. 
and we saw these and we thought, my God, have we never seen these as planters? It was so perfect. We didn't even have to paint it. I mean, it was a powder-coated white attic vent. And we just looked at it and went, this is brilliant. And all we had to do was create a back for it, a way to hang it, and some drainage at the bottom. So, I mean, it probably didn't even really need to do that, but it got made it drain out much quicker. And there you had it. I mean, it really came out beautiful. And then we had a client who was not that far away from the store that our landscape designer had done her house. And she had this just beautiful modern yard, and they had built that fence that we show that installation on. And it was so beautiful. She was madly, madly in love with the project. I think we ended up leaving it there for her because she liked it so much. It was just incredible. So that was another just incredible happy accident. It's such a simple project that we almost feel guilty. Yeah, so you're (laughs) basically, you're using these attic vents that you found at a hardware store. And then the other, like, extremely clever ingenuity that accompanies this project is the fact that you used an old plastic placemat to create a back for these. And and I'm looking at the placemat going, what is that? And then I'm reading and I'm going, oh my gosh, she is repurposing plastic placemats now. I can't even stand it. It was just such a great project start to finish. Yeah, it's nice to be able to repurpose things from home or go find cheap things that, you know, you can go to Goodwill and find, you know, there's all sorts of places where you, you don't have to spend a lot of money. That's exactly right. Well, the other one that I loved was the stock tank water garden. You can't find an easier DIY, I don't think, in the book. Do you want to share about how you up-leveled the common stock tank into something really spectacular in your book? You know what? This is Mary, and I personally love stock tanks, and you see them a lot out here in L.A. as planters. They make great fountains. We had talked about doing a water garden, and it was the perfect opportunity. You want to make sure with the spray paint that it's a metallic spray paint and that it's a good spray paint. It looks like what you did is you left the top lip of the stock tank, the original color, that silver color. But then this base, you picked a color that it was a metallic, shiny copper, and it just was so beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. It is. A, it is. It's a copper metallic spray paint. And I, and I think that's what makes it so pretty is you've got that galvanized metal and then you've got that warm silver with it. And it's that two-tone that brings it to kind of life. If, and if it had been just a regular stock tank, it's all one color. It's that two-tone that makes it so pretty. Well, garden blogger Lori Bull inspired one of your projects. I was really tickled to see this in your book. And you called these flying saucer planters. They're quite ingenious. I'm wondering if you can just read what you wrote on the introduction to these flying saucer planters on page 133. And then tell us everything. Tell us about how you made these. Well, sure, I'll do that. (laughs) Okay, so here we go. From the moment we first saw this project, created by our good friend and blogger, Lori Bull, we knew we wanted to do something similar. Lori was inspired by some amazing rusted metal dishes she had spied during a garden tour. Knowing she could never afford the custom-made metal pieces, she decided to make her own version with bird feeders she found in a Portland feed store. We were excited to try this approach, but we simply could not find the right feeders. Finally, we realized the feeders reminded us of industrial salad bowls, which are very inexpensive, readily available in restaurant supply stores or online, and made of super durable stainless steel. Problem solved. So, problem solved, except for stainless steel, is very difficult to drill into or to adhere to. But no, it was, I actually had seen Lori, was madly in love with those flying saucers. And of course, I asked her, like, how did you do it? And her wonderful husband made them for her. But the key was finding those feeders. And I thought, oh, no big deal. I'm just going to find those anywhere. Well, that was not an easy thing to find. I mean, I gave up. I never could find them. They always reminded me of, remember in electric stoves, those little uh, cups that you put in there? You know how they have, the, that's the way the, I guess the heat gets spread out. There's a little stainless steel cup in there, but those are so little. So I yeah. thought that could work, but they were just too little. And really, it was, I just thought, I finally thought salad bowls. They're a little deeper than Lori's version, but they really fit the bill. And I, I love the idea of how they just float over another planting. 
So it sort of gives you this great elevation. And I, I like how, how sculptural they are. Yeah, They're really, really fun. They work great with succulents and all sorts of things like that. And you could actually very easily remove them for the winter or something like that and house them inside. And we did them on PVC. Lori's versions were done with metal fence posts. So that's oh, sure. a lot harder to work with. Yes. So the PVC was so much better. And then we could actually color it. So I got paint to match the trim. You can't really see it in the photo of the bits in the book because it's not a wide enough shot of the house. But I actually matched the poles to match the trim of the house. And it really came out cool. I really liked it. And now I'm so stuck on this whole concept after we talked about the stock tank of using the two-tone metallic. It would be cool to see it in a metallic base, too, in another tone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would look great. You know, the next section of your book is all about the work that you did with terracotta pieces. And I loved the projects, but I also greatly appreciated your commentary on terracotta. So I'm wondering if you can share your overview and then let's talk about working with the ubiquitous terracotta pot. I'll be happy to do that too. <laughs> um, so, Annette, so reading from the book, terracotta pots are the most common containers around. The Italian versions can be quite expensive, but their quality is impeccable. Pots from Mexico and South America are prone to disintegrating quickly because of low firing temperatures in the kiln. The Asian versions, usually made in Vietnam, lack the refinement of their Italian cousins, but are far superior in quality to those made in Mexico. Many building supplies are also made from good quality terracotta, and some, like chimney flues, offer interesting new shapes. Most terracotta looks alike, but we have found a couple of ways to change things up. So when you see Mexican terracotta, it's uh, usually got black, like Henry's almost, inside of it to seal it because it's fired so low, it just disintegrates. And, and I never knew any of this before I got into this business that I just thought terracotta was terracotta, mm -hmm. but it's, it's so far from the truth. And the reason the chimney flues are such a great thing to use is because they're fired so high because they have to withstand the temperatures of your fireplace. And it's super, super hard and nothing's getting through those. So mm. terracotta is interesting. It's not a one-size-fits-all situation at all. Yeah, I guess I never realized either all the different sources for it. So I loved that part of the introduction because I, I just didn't appreciate that. Now, we can't talk about your section on terracotta without mentioning the inspiring work of Pawina Studio. Tell us about how this inspired you and how you were able to replicate it with a design all your own. Uh, well, this is Mary. So pa Paulina is just really, she's a graphic artist turned ceramicist, and she does a lot of beautiful work. And she works out of a studio called Zim in Pasadena, which has produced some really amazing ceramicists. Her work is all very graphic, and she came out with this one line that you'll see in our chimney flue planter, which is really, really graphic. And she did a very small pot, cast pot, if you will, and I wanted to create that on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. she, she works in a smaller scale, and I wanted it for outdoors on a bigger scale. So I took one of her designs and enlarged it, really. It changed the shape because the chimney flue planter is oval instead of round. So it changed the look of it a bit, but it's that really strong graphic color block. And it's just striking. That's all Pauline. I just took her design, really. But it's, it's graphic and bold and, and really beautiful. I bet you were really pleased with that one when that was done. I am. I was really pleased. And we actually, when we had our book opening, we did a, a, some giveaways and we gave, I kept one because I really wanted it, but we gave one of them away. Oh, lucky winner. Yeah, absolutely. I know. Uh, yeah, for sure. Well, the last section talks about organic materials. And I love what you said. You said, they will eventually decompose without consistent care. And I totally agree with that. I use a lot of organic materials in my garden. And I know that they're not going to last forever, even if I treat them and, and do take good care of them. But I still think they're worth it. I myself really like using baskets and I use woven containers. I love to use wooden ice cream buckets. I'm always forever sourcing those. 
But I find that the organic items, those organic materials, add so much warmth to the garden. What do you gals think? Yeah, uh, this is Mary. I agree with you 110%. It (laughs) is. And yes, things fall apart over time. And sometimes I think they actually look prettier once they've fallen apart a little bit. There's a certain beauty in when things age and sort of fall back to the earth. And I think it's it's a reminder. It's it's beautiful. It's kind of like the you know, the Japanese wabi sabi, the beauty of imperfection. Yes. And and I think organic speak to that in a big way. Well, and I also loved the roped in project. So let's talk a little bit about this easy DIY. I think the hardest thing for people who want to do a rope project of any kind is where to source that chunky rope. So where do you source it and how are you able to achieve such a stunning and universally loved result when you're putting together roped projects? That rope project, it was It was easy. It it was not hard at all. And you're using, you know, you can use those inside because you can use a nice saucer with that and use them inside just as easily keeping the nursery container. What I think for, for ropes, we did a natural hemp rope and you can buy those online. There's a local man here, but you can, you can source hemp rope online easily. But if you go into any hardware store, you can buy brightly colored rope, which would, I mean, that would be so much fun. You can get it in orange, you can get it flecked. There's so much rope out there. If you're in a boating community, boats all use ropes for buoys and stuff like that. So you can get it in boating supplies places. There's a lot of places to get rope and you don't have to just stick with hemp. You could do wild and wacky colors. You know, you can also, there's a net, you can color block them. So you could take or actually dip them. So you could do exactly what Mary had done with the roped in one and then take the whole planter and just dip it in paint and get a whole other effect because that dip dyeing is a big thing, but on the rope, it could be even more amazing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you would just, you would just use, you would use clothesline rope real easy. That's fantastic. How do you start and how do you end any type of rope project? Because you're wrapping. I mean, that part's easy once you get going. I'm just always more concerned about starting that rope and then ending it. What are your tips? Okay, when we started it, again, I used a silicone base for the water. I thought it would last longer. The first part with the very beginning of the rope, I cut it at an angle so it would fit under the lip of the 15 gallon. But if it doesn't have, it's easier to cut the angle and put it down that way because you can ride up over it when you do a return and hide it. Oh, so it's sure. not just a blunt piece. You're you're cutting it in an angle and overlaying the oh, other like piece that. on top of it, and it covers it and hides it. And that's how you do, that's how you end it too. And oh. I just use I use blue tape as I went along to you know as I to hold it in place. You know, because you want a nice, tight wrap. So it once you're going around and around, it's fine. And then when you're holding it, use tape to keep it all in place until it dries. I like that idea. Well, I have to say also, I cannot resist asking you guys, since you have a TV and film background, if you're not interested in doing a sequel, what I would call like a potted two. So if you were going to write a sequel to this book, what would you include? Where is your creativity taking you today? This is Annette. Well, funny that you should say that. (laughs) It's funny because the the, the frustration of this book was that it, it ended up being outdoor large containers and there's so many smaller ones that we wanted to talk about and to do and hanging containers and things with air plants air plants we love air plants and there's so many fun ways of displaying them and showing them so i think if we were going to do potted two we were talking about possibly doing it in things called what we're calling living vignettes you know how you make a display on your mantle because so many people live in, you know, areas of the country where you can't go outside and enjoy your outdoor planters. So how can you have it all year long? And I think that's also the big resurgence in house plants too, is that people are losing that fear of the house plants and they're embracing it inside. So we would really, really like to go down that avenue more and do smaller containers and just fun hanging things. And there's so many, I mean, there's 
endless possibilities of things to come up with. Ugh, you're so right. Well, and I love that idea too of working with the air plants because they are outrageously popular here in the Midwest. Oh, yeah. I think they're popular everywhere. I was just up in Portland and I was looking, um, you know, of course I went to all the great little stores up there. Everybody's got air plants. We um, actually did a cute little DIY uh, last month, I think. Um, we call them air rocks and it's using um, rocks and wire to create stands for, for air plants. Oh really gosh. cute. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that sounds adorable. Oh my yeah. goodness. So we call them air rocks and it was a, it, we did it for Father's Day. Yeah, we did. And it was, it, it's kind of nice because it basically takes jewelry making skills and, you know, a rock. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is crazy. Go forth. I love it. Go forth and rock. I love it. I love it. Well, before we wrap things up, we have to talk a little bit more about your potted store because you are available online. And I also have a shopping segment that I feature on the show each week as part of the Garden News Roundup. So I'm always looking for shopping for gardeners. So why don't you feature your top 10 list, things that people love to shop for on the potted online store? Sure, I'd be happy to share them with you. This is Annette. The biggest things that we sell on our website are our own exclusive designs because we don't sell them to anyone else. And the only place you can get them is from us. So probably the most popular on our side are those things. I would say 10 would be the midge table, which mainly because it's a beautiful tile table that we made. It's more the cost of it. It's, it's not the cheapest table to make. But we've done really, really well with it. Um, I would say probably nine would be our designer pot section. And like we were talking about Paulina earlier, we really, really, really try to cultivate relationships with local, not just local, actually all across the country, um, but small batch ceramicists, people who are truly artists or doing things that are, you know, just they're just not able to do them in large volumes, and many of them are one of a kind. Okay. So that section on our, our um, on our website is actually really good. It's ever evolving, so I'm not even going to pick one because it, it could changes all the time. I mean, sometimes we can't even get them online because they sell so quickly. Oh wow! <laughs> and then um, I would say number eight would be the succulent wall planters. Those are really fun. So that would be under the hanging section. And these are items that are in shape. So like California is huge here because obviously we're in California, but there's a great peace sign. We have a cactus. It's a cactus piece that we're getting. Uh, I think we'll probably have it in a couple of weeks that we'll get up there. But it's, you know, you can get letters and all sorts of different things. But those are hugely popular. And oh we're actually going to do a workshop of how to plant them next month. They're very, very fun. So you can get your state outline or you can get a monogram is what you're saying. You can get a monogram. Yeah, they, we, we don't have all the states. I think the Texas, California, um, I mean, anything could be done custom. So if somebody's really interested in something, they can contact us and we can you know, see about getting that made for them. But do we try to keep sort of a certain amount of stock things? But we're, we're actually making these triangles. And because the, the problem is that they're very expensive to plant those. So we're trying to create something that's small, that's inexpensive, but you could add on to it. You could do a whole bunch more of them. So, uh, you know, so that we're always trying to be considerate of cost. Sure. And we totally get that. So leading into number seven, which is the hippie mobile. This is a this is a mobile that I don't even remember where we originally got it from, but it was it was some company that was sort of a one of. They did it. They never did it again. And it was such a fabulous mobile that we contracted our uh, people who make most of our mobiles to make it, and now it's become a staple. So we didn't design it, but we had it recreated. Describe and it. It's a mobile made out of recycled mirrors and beads, glass beads, and it hangs. And I had to actually take mine down because my dog went ballistic every time. It, it got, hey, it's 4 o'clock because the sun was hitting it at 4 o'clock, making <laughs> light all over my yard. And the dog was driving everyone crazy when it oh. stopped barking. <laughs> so it's a beautiful mobile that really reflects. Like, I'm totally like a magpie, I think, with shiny objects. So um, I just love anything like that that reflects light. And it's been a really, really good seller for us. So now kind of going more into our original design, uh, the Point Pot, which was actually designed by a very good friend of ours, that's been a very big seller. And then the Orbit, which was a planner we did a couple of years ago, 
that one going on to our leggy stands. The stands are basically a hairpin stand. Uh, we just find a lot of those lately because it's very difficult to find uh, a good plant stand. And the orbit fits beautifully on it. What does that look like? So, what does it, the orbit look like? So the orbit looks like a flying saucer. Apparently mm-hmm. we're very into flying saucers. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it it looks like a flying saucer. So, um, but it's set, And it was really kind of serendipitous that the stand works so well with the planter. Uh, we were doing a photo shoot for the stand and went, oh, my goodness, this is the best thing ever. So that has been a very, very good, good one for us. Wow. And then the city planter... Um, I would say, and number three is the city planter. And that, that that was sort of our answer to these wall planters, that we wanted to come up with a piece of sort of wall art that you could do outside or inside. I, I was going to say, actually, the gable planter and the wall pocket that are in our book, those are kind of the answer to the city planter. They're the DIY version of that. And then how about that point planter you mentioned? What does that look like? So the point pot looks like two diamonds on top of each other. And what's great about it is it can hang or it can sit on a table or it can actually kind of go onto a wall. That was another accident with the drainage hole. And we're like, hey, you can hang it on the wall. I love that. (laughs) I always love something that you can use 20 different ways. Yeah, So it's, It's the MacGyver of pot. Wow. How about in the number two spot? Well, the number two pot is the circle pot which is our biggest seller. Well, actually, no, the no, Mary's looking at me going like, isn't that number one? <laughs> but <laughs> crazily enough, the, the, our number one seller on our website is the fire pit. Oh, yeah. We have this amazing fire pit. It's solid concrete, but it's really, really modern. And it works beautifully. It's just been our best seller. I mean, it's, it's the golden goose that keeps on giving. I, I've never been able to find a replacement for it. I mean, there's other people who make them, but they sell them for $3,000. So it's just been a wonderful, wonderful seller for us. And people have it's been finding us everywhere for that fire pit. Yeah, we end up shipping it all over the country because they're hard to source. And what's your price point, gals? There, there's a couple of different sizes, but it's, I think, 475 to 625 something like that. I'd have to look. But unfortunately, what's expensive is the shipping. It's like $300 to ship it, which half the time we're losing money on the shipping. I know that sounds crazy, but so it ends up costing less than $1,000. But any place else you look, and they're two to $3,000 wow. unshipped. So they're a good value. That's fantastic. So Fire Pit, I would have never guessed. That's your number one seller. Our number one seller. That's tremendous. Well, and I love the whole monogram wall planter. I love that idea. Yeah, those are really fun. Well, ladies, it has been such a treat to chat with you and talk about Potted, your book, and then Potted, your store, and all your great ideas. Let's review any upcoming events that you might have and how people can find you online. What we do have coming up is we're going to be doing a demo of one of our projects in the book at the Theodore Payne Foundation in the Los Angeles area. It is a foundation that is dedicated to native plants, and we're doing that on September 16th at, I think, 11 o'clock. It's on our website, and it's on theirs, I believe, as well. But we're going to do a DIY of the tile planter. Oh, love that one. Yeah, I do too. And how to find us, we are at Potted Store, P-O-T-T-E-D-S-T-O-R-E. And that's on Twitter and Instagram. Instagram is kind of our favorite one. And on Facebook, it's Potted LA. And that is where you can find us on social media. And our website is PottedStore.com. We also recently were uh, we did another project for apartment therapy DIY section they're doing about mounting staghorn ferns, but also sort of how to elevate the mounting boards on staghorn ferns and doing this sort of dip dye thing. I'd seen it done with furniture, and so we thought, hey, let's do it with staghorn ferns. We also did a workshop in the store doing that too, where we just painted the boards, but it was so much fun. And it like all of a sudden these regular staghorn ferns just looked amazing on all these colored boards. So. That's actually going to be a blog post on our site very soon. Oh, my goodness. Well, hold the phone. You've got to tell me more. I love that whole idea. Can you pretend like we're sitting in the store with you and you're going to walk us through how to mount a staghorn fern? <laughs> oh, really? You want me to act? Actually, I got taught how to mount a staghorn fern by the guy who did it by, from the Arboretum, the Los Angeles Arboretum, and he was a sweet old man. 
And it was, it was so simple, I couldn't believe it. But basically what you do is you get, um, you soak some sphagnum moss, you put it on a board, you take your staghorn fern, you lay it on top of that. So basically to see the, the outline of how big you need to cover, you, you need to adhere it to the board. So what you do is you set the saccharine fern down there and you look kind of eyeball around it. I usually do it by nailing nails all around the perimeter of that and then take off the sphagnum moss and the saccharine fern. And then I nail the nails in because it's kind of hard to do it with the fern on it. Put the fern back on top of the board and then you get fishing line, really. The, the, the one important thing is just to make sure you get a nail with a wide enough nail head because otherwise the line pulls off the nail. But anyway, so you put it, you just tie a knot and just start going, crisscrossing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And there's like 8 million different ways people do it. Some people just wrap the whole board. But as I've always said, we're about pretty. So, you know, you want to do it as neatly as possible. And the nails kind of give you a sort of a cool, you're basically making a U shape of the nails. Eventually, the staghorn fern, as it grows, will cover all the nails, the board, everything. Oh. I think I have a staghorn fern that's like seven feet across at my house. Oh, wow. But um, so it doesn't matter. They they just when they when they're growing in the wild, they just kind of fall into the crook of a tree and then they just start encircling the tree. So it doesn't really matter what it looks like in the end because the plant's going to cover it. But it takes it quite a while, and in the meantime, you have a beautiful board. Yes, you yeah, do. It takes a long time. And then how do you guys care for those? Do you just miss them or what do you do? Well, I usually keep them outside, so I just hose them off like anything else. But inside, you can put them in a shower. You know, it's sphagnum moss and moss dries out quicker than soil. So the, the idea is, is that you need to hydrate that moss, but you need to really hydrate that moss. So the problem with spraying is that most people don't spray enough. You can spray, just know that you're going to have to do it, you know, with some vigor. Don't just go spray, spray and go, oh, it's water. That, that doesn't work. You really, really have to spray it. Uh, so if that's the method you want to do, that's fine. Just be vigorous about it. Otherwise, the shower is a great method because then you can just put it in there, shower it off, it gets the leaves nice and wet, and leave it in there for a half hour so it stops dripping and hang it back up. What a great idea. And that's coming up. That'll be in apartment therapy probably by the time this episode airs, right? I think it will be, yeah. yeah. That's Somewhere fantastic. middle of August. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, because this show will come out on August 11th. And so if people are curious, they can catch you there. They can also get your book. It's called Potted Make Your Own Stylish Garden Containers. And it's by Annette Gutierrez and Mary Gray. Ladies, I can't thank you enough for being on the show with me today. This was so fun. Thank you, Jennifer. It was a lot of fun to hash over the book with you and be re-inspired by talking to you. I know. Now we're going Mm, potted too. <laughs> potted too. That's right. You have a new mission. Yeah. Thanks again. Wonderful. Well, that's it for our show today featuring Annette Gutierrez and Mary Gray, authors of Potted, Make Your Own Stylish Garden Containers. I hope you found some of these ideas exciting and energizing, and I hope you're intrigued by the idea of turning your own garden into a potted oasis. The book has something for everyone, from entryway planters crafted from garbage cans to hanging planters made with kitchenware. Annette and Mary have come up with designs you've never seen before. They offer a different spin on some very familiar favorites. You can either follow their instructions exactly or, for even more fun, customize them to suit your own personality. And if you share your creations on social media, Annette and Mary would love to see them. So use the hashtag PottedStyleDIY. Well, I hope you get a chance to pick up a copy of Annette and Mary's book, Potted, Make your own stylish garden containers. If you're looking for gift ideas, file this one away. It would also make a great book for the holidays. It's a super inspiring read. And as Annette and Mary like to say, their book will help you boldly go where no planter has gone before by empowering you to create show-stopping containers. 
Well, just a reminder that I'll have all of the generous information that Annette and Mary shared on the show today over at my website, sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. You'll find the link to the podcast pages there, as well as the Facebook group. And Annette and Mary are giving away five copies of their book, to some lucky listeners in the listener community over at the Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group. So if you'd like to win the book, you have to be in the community. So the next time you're in Facebook, just type in Still Growing Podcast group and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. And don't forget about the masterminds that I'm offering this fall. I still have spots available in my three-month masterminds. They're starting up in September, and I'd love to work with you in one of my groups. I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions for helping me put the show together today. Eric Begay, my editor, Ein Kadena, my copywriter, and David Gregerson, my project manager. I'd also like to recognize my listener advisory board members out of the listener community, and they are Beth Engel, Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in North Mississippi and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine, Amy Von Atchen, Patricia Chandler Newport. Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens out of Kego Harbor, Michigan, Deb Gibson, and Peggy Ann Montgomery, the brand manager over at American Beauty's Native Plants. And Peggy was featured back in episode 553, where we talked all about native plants. And I certainly hope you're incorporating some native plants into your 2017 gardens. I hope you find some time to do a little DIY this week in the garden. And if you do, don't forget to use the hashtag potted style DIY. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. 